Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Dell Technologies World 2018. Brought to you by Dell EMC and its ecosystem partners. Welcome to Las Vegas, everybody. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm here with Stu Miniman and this is the inaugural Dell Technologies World and Pat Gelsinger is here. He's the hey, great to be with President you, Dave. CEO of, of VMware. Awesome to see you, our number oh, one you. guest of all time. <laughs> <laughs> this is like our ninth uh, 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 Dell slash EMC World and your 900th <laughs> Cube interview, but uh, we it never gets old, Pat. It's really a pleasure to see you. Oh, it's always fun to be with you guys. Thank you for the chance to spend some time on the Cube, and you've come a long way. So, thank you for noticing. So, you were the first, and, and people are recognizing this, to really sort of call the boom in the data center. Uh, we certainly have seen it with, with cloud, and we saw a little bit with, with data and big data, now digital transformation, but well over a year ago, you said, we have tailwinds, it just feels right. So, good call. Yeah, hey, thank you. And you know, clearly, uh, like the IDC's Gartners, you know, as they began last year, two to three percent growth. I said, no, I think it's at least two X that. And we ended the year almost six percent growth in IT, and everybody's raised their forecast, and I think they're still a little bit conservative. And I think in this period where technology is becoming more pervasive in everything, Every business is becoming a tech business. Every area of every business is becoming influenced by tech. And as a result, hey, I think we're going to see a long run of tech strength and every company in tech is going to benefit and those that are well positioned are going to benefit in a big way. Yeah, you see, you call it tech is breaking out of tech. Yep, yep, absolutely, <laughs> right? You know, we're no longer that little IT thing stuck in the back corner making sure your mail runs. It's now everything. You know, back office has become front office. Right, you know, every aspect of data becomes mission critical for the business. As some have called it, you know, data is the new oil, right, uh, in the future. And it really is uh, thrilling to see some of our customers. And Michael had a few on stage this morning doing really pretty cool things. Well, VMware is on fire. I mean, it's only 10% of Dell's revenue, but it's half, it generates half of its operating cash flow. Obviously, we love the software business, <laughs> of course. Talk about your business, the, the core is doing really well, you got NSX cranking, vSAN cranking, the cloud now, there's clarity in cloud. Give us the overview of your business and give us the update. Sure, and, and as I say, you know, there's three reasons we're doing well. You know, one is our strategy is resonating with customers. And you know, when you got strategic resonance with customers, you're not in the purchasing department, you're in the business units, the CIO's office. So strategy is resonating well across what we do for private cloud, what we're doing for public cloud, what we're doing for end user and workforce transformation, our security strategy, every aspect is resonating. You know, second, we're executing well. And I'll say, you know, your good strategy, you're executing it well, and uh, you know, clearly the Dell momentum has helped us. We're ahead of schedules on the synergies uh, that we've laid out, and that's been a powerful accelerant. You know, it's like, we're doing well, you know, and you put some turbochargers on, oh, you know, this is gone. And then finally, as we said, it's a good market, right? And well-positioned tech companies are benefiting from that. So across our product families, you know, NSX, uh, vSAN, and HCI, you know, our cloud management is really performing the end user computing, you know, all of these seeing you know, 30, 50, 100% growth rates. You know, uh, my overall cloud business, you know, VMware's growing in the teens, you know, my cloud business is growing in the 30s and uh, way ahead of the uh, growth rate of the business. So pretty much everything that we've laid out is firing on all cylinders. Yeah. Pat, I, I think most people understand some of the products of VMware. You know, I think it's you know, 20 years now since server virtualization loss. Mm -hmm. you know, you've you know, great momentum with NSX, with vSAN. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the digital platform though. Uh, sure. you know, how does VMware look you know, for the next five to 10 years, fit into the vision 2030 like Michael was talking yeah, about? Yeah, and you know, very much, you know, as I'd say, we, you know, our objective is to be the essential, ubiquitous digital infrastructure, right? Where you know, this idea, you know, essential. Boy, you know, we run this mission critical stuff and increasingly we're seeing businesses put their crown jewels running on VMware. You know, because we ran a lot of the stuff in the past. We'd run your SharePoints, your Outlooks, and so on. But now they're putting core banking on us, you know, core transactional platform. They just say, you are essential, ubiquitous. You know, our strategy is to move all the way to the edge and the IoT use cases into the core networks of our service provider partners. You know, to, as I say, you know, build these four clouds. The private cloud, the public cloud, the telco cloud and the NF or, or the IoT cloud, all of those on a common infrastructure that enables applications to build on and leverage 
all of the above. So, you know, we're increasingly ubiquitous digital infrastructure, meaning that they can build their applications from the past as well as in the future on us. And as we're partnering with Pivotal, with our PKS strategy, reaching more to the developer, right, and delivering that infrastructure for the next generation apps. And of course, the dirty secret is, is that almost all of the cool new apps are some ugly combination of new and old. And if we can give a common operational security management and automation environment that transcends their cool new container and function as a service, but combine it in a consistent operational and security environment with today's infrastructure, oh, that's like the big easy button for IT. Got it, we can take you to the future without giving up the past. We hear from our you know, CXOs in our community and our audience, they really, they want to get digital right. So my question to you is, what kind of conversations are you having yeah. with executives around getting digital right? Uh -huh. Yeah, and lots of those things are, you know, like uh, just with a big uh, media company, it was with a huge bank uh, on the phone with a, a big consumer goods product uh, last week. You know, these interactions occurring, you know, like you say, they want to get it right. You know, and with it, we're seeing the conversation shift because a lot of it used to be, you know, best of breed. Oh, uh, that, that one looks good and I'll stitch it together with this and maybe I'll put it that. And a lot of their bandwidth was being put to putting the pieces together. And we're saying no, right? What you want to do is have robust infrastructure, increasingly rely on fewer, more strategic vendors. It's my job to put it together so you can take your investments and put them into the applications and services that really differentiate your business. And this is becoming a sea change in how we work with customers and say, okay, yeah, I, I can't stitch all these pieces together. I can't have 100 security vendors. I must rely on fewer vendors in much more strategic ways. And in that, obviously, we're you know, benefiting from that enormously, and they're expecting us to step up like never before to be a partner with them, and it really is a thrilling time for us. So that simplifies all the complexity on their end, at least in concept. Who is leading this charge? Do you, do you discern any patterns of the guys that are getting it right versus the guys that are maybe struggling or maybe, maybe complacent, just specifically in terms of leadership? Yeah, and it's super, super interesting because I find leaders in every industry, right? You know, you find leaders and laggards in those. You know, you know I had one customer a lot long ago say, hey, is that virtualization stuff? Can I really rely on it? <laughs> it's sort of like a uh, ding dong, right? You know, you know, you're now the trailing edge of technology. But for every one of those trailers, we're seeing those front end customers. And you saw some of them on stage this morning where they're just really going and saying, boy, we are now ready to ante in in a big way. We're seeing that in car companies. We're seeing that in financial services companies. We're seeing that in supply chain uh, companies. And some of those are now really seeing these startups now putting pressure on their business for the first time. And they say, no, we got to innovate in a very aggressive way. And for that, you know, the Dell Technologies family, you know, all of us coming together you know, with our each skills and focus areas, but together being able to present that holistic solution that says, that's right, we can lead you on digital transformation. We can change your infrastructure, we can build in security, we can transform your workplace, we can take you to the multi-cloud future, we got it. Yeah, Pat, there was one, one of the things that caught my ear. Allison Dew, when she was talking about the Dell Technology Institute, said that together, mm -hmm. you're going to become a force for good. Mm -hmm. I know that's something that's near and dear to your heart. Yeah. So maybe you talk about the tech and the security and everything. What about the, the Dell families as, as a force for good yeah. out there? Yeah, and I've described uh, this era, and I've said there's four superpowers. You know, technology superpowers that are bigger than any of us, right? And the four I describe, you know, mobile, right? The ability to reach anyone. Over half the planet is now connected. Cloud, the ability to scale as never before. AI, the ability to bring intelligence to everything. And IoT, the ability to bridge to the physical world everywhere. And those four are really reinforcing each other, right? They're accelerating each other. As Michael said, you know, today, the fastest day of your life. Today, the slowest day of the rest of your life for tech evolution and we see them just causing and accelerating each to go. As I you know, uh, mentioned in my uh, talk uh, uh, this week at the Grow Awards in Silicon Valley, you know, in 1986, I was making the 486 a great AI chip. Right, <laughs> and it's like, what? 31 years ago, and now it's a success because the superpowers are coming together. The compute is now big enough, the data is now voluminous enough that we can do things never possible before. But with that, technology is neutral. The Gutenberg printing press did the Bible, you know, Luther's Bible. It also prints Playboy, it sort of doesn't care. 
technology is neutral, and it's our job as a tech industry to shape technology for good. You know, that's our obligation, and increasingly we need to be involved in and shaping legislations, policies, laws, to enable tech to be that force for good. Yeah. Pat, you mentioned uh, kind of the, the speed of change in the industry. You're a public company with you know, a lot of employees. How does internally, how do you keep up with the pace of change, keep inspiring people, <laughs> get them working on the next thing? You know, Michael talked about going private was one of the things that would help him yeah. restructure and get ready for that. So maybe uh -huh. discuss that dynamic. Well, you know, and for us, you know, as a software company living in Silicon Valley, we feel it every day, right? I'll tell you, you know, we're, you know, we see these startups, you know, that are hovering around our people and our buildings, and they got ideas, you know. So we're synthesizing those ideas. We have our own research effort, our advanced, advanced product efforts. We're engaging, you know, in thousands of customer interactions per day. And ultimately, it's my job to create a culture that enables my 8,000 software engineers to go for it every single day. Right, where they are just, you know, they love what we do as a company, they love who we are as a company, our values, and then find ways that we enable our teams to, what I say, innovate in everything. Not just in R&D, but how we sell our products, how we support our customers, you know, how we enable these new use cases. We have to innovate in everything if we're going to pay, keep pace with this industry. And to some degree, you know, I think it's almost in the water in Silicon Valley, right? You know, you, know, you get some you know, crazy uh, master student coming out of Stanford and he thinks he's going to start up a company to displace me. It's like, what are you talking about, right? You know, but we feel that every day and as we bring those people into our environment, creating that culture that allows everybody to innovate in everything. So it's hard to argue that things aren't getting faster, that speed, but speed is an interesting question. When you think about blockchains and, and AI and natural language processing, just digital in general, there's a lot of complexity in terms sure. of adopting those things. So mm -hmm. speed versus ad adoption, what do, you, what do you see in terms of, of adoption? Yeah, you know, in a lot of these things, like, you know, you look at a technology like NSX, cool, breakthrough. You know, we're five years old now almost on NSX, right. you know, since we did the NYSERA acquisition as a starting point, four and a half years on NSX. And some of these things need to be sedimented, as I describe it, into the infrastructure, hardened, you know, when you've really proven all of the edge cases. Yeah. You know, those things don't move every day. Right, right, fossilized, right. furrier word. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, there is, you know, similarly with vSAN, Boy, these edge mm. use cases, data recovery, pounding on the right, you know, the periphery, uh, failure cases, disk drives, you know, failure modes and flash drives. Some of those things need to be sedimented. But as you think about those layers, always it's, you know, how do you sediment? How do you standardize? And then expose them as APIs and services to the next layer. And every layer as you go up the stack gets faster and faster, right? So as somebody would consume the software-defined data center, they need to be able to do that pretty fast. You know, how can I make, you know, VM, we just released 6.7, you know, which reduced by an order of magnitude the time to launch a VM. You know, uh, increase the, uh, by 20x the amount of mm -hmm. vCenter bandwidth, just so I can go faster. Not that I needed to go faster for VMs, I needed to go faster that I can put containers in VMs, and they need much higher speed of operation. So to me, it's this constant standardization, sedimenting, integrating, and then building more and more agile surfaces as you go higher in the stack that allows people to build applications where literally they're pushing updates, right, uh, and uh, seeing their CI, CD pipeline allow new code releases every day. I'm not changing NSX every day, but I am changing my container environment for that new app literally every day, and the whole stack needs to support that. Cloud partnerships, we talked uh, last year at VMworld about the clarity that the AWS deal brought. Of course, you have an arrangement with IBM, you're doing stuff with Kubernetes, so just talk about your posture with the big cloud players, mm -hmm. how that has affected your business and where you see it going. Yeah, you know, clearly uh, the cloud strategy, the AWS partnership, as I said, more than anything else, when we announced that, people moved their views of VMware. Oh, I get it, VMware isn't part of my private cloud or part of my past, they're the bridge to the future. And that has been sort of a game-changing perspective where we can truly enable this hybrid cloud experience, where I can take you and take your existing data centers, I can move them into a range of public cloud partners, AWS, IBM, you know, and be able to operate seamlessly in a truly hybrid way. Oh, your data center's getting a little hot, let's move a few workloads out. Oh, it's getting a little bit uh, uh, cool, let's move some workloads back. We can truly do that now in a seamless, hybrid, multi-cloud way. And customers, as they see that, it's not only the most cost efficient, 
right? It also allows them to deal with unique business requirements, geo requirements that they might have. Oh, in, G in Europe, I have to be on a GDPR cloud in Germany. Okay, we support, we have a right, here. You know, here's our portfolio. Other cases, it's like, oh, I really want to do take advantage of those proprietary services that some of the cloud vendors are doing. You know, you know maybe, maybe in fact that new AI service is something that I could differentiate my business on, but the bulk of my workload, I want to have it on this hybrid uh, platform that truly does give them more freedom and choice over time, while still meeting unique compliance, legal, security uh, issues as they've come to know and love uh, from VMware over time. So to clarify, is it, are you seeing it as use case specific or is it people wanting to be, bring that cloud experience on-prem or is it both? It, it is truly both. Because what you've seen is many people, and if we were talking four years ago, you would have been asking me questions, oh, you know, I just talked to Fred and he says everything is going to the cloud, right? You know, and people tried that student body right to the cloud of their existing apps and it was like, oh, crap. Right, you know, it's hard to re-platform, to refactor those applications. And when I got there, I got the same app. Right, you know, it's like, wow, that was a lot of investment to not get much return. Right. Now they look at it and they say, oh boy, you know, I can build some new apps in cool new ways, right, with these cloud native services. I can now have this agile, private, hybrid cloud environment, and I truly can operationalize across that in a flexible way. And sometimes we have customers that are bringing workloads out of native cloud and saying, oh, that's become too big in my operation role. You know, I have different governance requirements. I'm going to bring that one back. Other cases are saying, oh, I didn't want to move it to the VMware cloud on Amazon or you know, IBM, the migration service is really powerful. I want to get out of the data center. Other cases, they look at their cost of capital and the size and scale they're operating and says, hey, I'm going to keep 80% on premise forever, but I never want to be locked in that I can't take advantage of that you know, should there be a new service. It really is all of the above. And VMware and our Dell relationship and our key cloud partners, now 4,100 cloud partners strong, is really stepping into that in a pretty unique and powerful way. And the key is that operational impact, as yeah. Pat is yeah, saying. So, so Pat, just one of the challenges we've heard from users we talk to is, it, this was supposed to get simpler. Yeah. You know, <laughs> virtualizing it, you know, I kept all my old applications. Going to the cloud, there, there's more SKUs of compute in the public cloud than there are <laughs> if I was to buy from <laughs> Dell.com. Um, you know, in management, you know, we're making steps, but you know, it's heterogeneous, it's always add, nothing ever dies. H how do we help customers through this? Yeah, and I do think they're, you know, we're definitely hearing that from customers. Yeah. And you know, they're looking to us to make these things simpler. And I think we've now you know, laid the templates for a truly simpler world, right? In the security domain, intrinsic security, build many of the base security capabilities into the platform. Automation, automate across these multiple cloud environments so you don't care uh, about it. We're taking care of it against your policies. Being able to do that you know, and have you know, an increasingly autonomous infrastructure that truly is responding and operationalizing those environments without you having to put personnel and uh, specific investments right at that fundamental operations level because it's too big, it's too fast. You can't respond at the pace the business uh, requires. So I feel really good. We have some key innovations you'll see us announcing. Uh, we're going to talk at VMworld, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay, I will gonna, I have some, we have some there. cool announcements in this yeah. area by VMworld as well, specifically in some of these management automation. We see some of that applying some new AI, ML techniques uh, to be able to help with some of those workload management and policy management areas. So some really cool things going on to help these problems specifically. And we've seen, uh, we saw a blog recently about you guys working on some blockchain stuff. I know yeah. it's early days there, but yeah. it's an exciting new technology. Yeah, and the blockchain stuff is what I'm really, really uh, pretty excited about. We have some algorithmic breakthroughs that right now, you know, blockchain on a, on a log a scale, basically scales at, you know, log or super log, right? Which right. meaning it's, you know, it's problematic, right? As you get lots of nodes, right? You know, the time to resolve nodes gets to be you know, uh, exponentially expensive uh, to uh, be able to resolve. We've come up with some algorithmic breakthroughs that drop that to near linear. And when people look at that, they sort of say, wow, I can make my blockchain environments much larger, much more distributed as a result. So as a result of some of that work, we'll be increasingly making blockchain as a primitive. You know, we're not trying to deal with the application level you know, for insurance, for financial, but we can increasingly deliver a primitive infrastructure along with vSphere and the VMware environment that says, yeah, we've taken care of that base issue 
We've guaranteed it from a vendor you trusted. And uh, you might remember there was a couple of breaches of some of the blockchain oh, yeah. implementations. So you know, we hope to take care of some of those hard problems for customers and bring some uh, good breakthrough engineering from VMware to that problem. Well, it's great to see companies like VMware and, and you know, enterprise place, IBM obviously involved in bringing some credibility yeah. to that space, <laughs> which you know, everybody sees crypto, oh, they, they, they don't walk, they run. But there's real potential in the technology. I want to ask you about a Silicon Valley question. Any okay. Chance I get. So, if I broadly define Silicon Valley, let's include you know, Seattle. Uh, and we generally the, don't do that, but that's okay. But we'll, I'm going to we'll take this we'll because take it's technology okay. industry. <laughs> we'll but the technology <laughs> industry seems to have this dual disruption agenda. We've always sort of seen tech companies own this horizontal stack, you know, and go attack and cloud and big data and disruption. But it seems like with digital, you're, you're seeing them attack new industries, whether it's healthcare or oh. groceries or media. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? Can Silicon Valley, broadly defined, pull off this dual disruption agenda? You know, I, I really believe it can, right? Uh, in that, I'm you know, being part of it, I'm a huge optimist on it. I don't think it will be exclusive to Silicon Valley, uh -huh. right? You know, there's a tech community in Boston that's a bit more focused on healthcare, right? Obviously, the cloud guys coming out of uh, Seattle, you know, Austin and you know, uh, Texas has increasing research triangle. When you go around the world, you see more places because you know, in that sense, uh, one of my favorite uh, you know uh, cartoons is a picture of a dog at a terminal. I'm sure it was a Dell terminal, but you know, it's, and the caption reads. Right, on the internet they don't know you're a dog. Right, you know, the point being, you know, hey, yeah. when you're on the net, it doesn't matter where you are, right, and it enables innovation, whether that's uh, Afghanistan, whether that's Bangladesh, whether that's uh, Myanmar, you know, any of those places become equal on the net, and it does open up that domain of innovation. So I view it much more as tech is disrupting everything, and that's my theme of tech is breaking out of tech. Clearly the hub of that is Silicon Valley. Right, you know, that's a center where you know, you know, every third door is a new startup as you walk down the street. It really is an incredible experience. But increasingly, you know, that innovative, disruptive spirit is breaking out of Silicon Valley to you know, literally across the world. You know, you know, the Chinese think they might be the number one. You know, Europeans, oh, uh, sort of a renaissance in France, you know, that we haven't seen for many years, and so on. And I do believe that it will continue to be technology in this horizontal way, you know, but increasingly, and I think you know, Amazon has led the way on this, sure. is that you're seeing, boy, we can disrupt entire industries, you know, leveraging that, you know, Tesla and automotive and Airbnbs, all of these are changing industries in fundamental uh, ways, and I do not see that slowing down at all. You know, I'm thrilled to see like, you know, healthcare, right? Boy, I have not seen, you know, this amount of disruptive technology startups in healthcare. Healthcare, one of the lowest percentage of spend on IT. Can you imagine that? Right, yeah, you know, at that level, and boy, we're starting to see that pick up. So industry by industry, I think we're just getting started. And, and that's an industry that is really ripe for, for disruption. Oh my gosh. So Pat, we're going to hear about some of this this afternoon at your keynote, I presume. Maybe show uh, us a little a leg things. there and we'll wrap. Yeah, yeah. Bring it home. Hey, you know, we're, uh, today's keynote, uh, obviously going to talk about, uh, you know, the better together. Uh, aspects, we'll update on vSAN and HCI and you know, our strategy there, some of the cool things we're doing with Dell and AirWatch Workspace ONE and the client space. You know, we're going to talk about networking. You know, I'm going to lay out our networking uh, strategy and we're going to give a teaser this afternoon of a broad set of networking announcements uh, that we're doing this week and uh, hope to really lay out what we think of as the virtual cloud network of the future and how the network is essential uh, to that uh, future. So we're going to have a little bit of fun there and you'll see me don the VR uh, oh, uh, headset great. and hey, we're going to go uh, into the virtual, virtual data center today Ooh. and uh, it'll, it'll be fun. Virtualization inception. There we go. <laughs> well, Pat, on a personal note, you've been a great friend of theCUBE and we really appreciate that and uh, you've been an awesome guest. We saw you come from Intel with an amazing career, and we just see it going from there. So congratulations on all your personal success, your team success, and continued. Good to hey, see. Hey, love you guys. It's always great to be on theCUBE. You guys do a fabulous uh, uh, job you you. Know, for uh, live tech coverage, and it really has been a lot of fun. And uh, next year, we're going to go party for your 10-year anniversary That's right. of theCUBE. Love it. Okay, all right, cool. Pat, Very great, good. Great Thank to you. see you. Thanks so much. Very good. Thanks. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Dell Technologies World. You're watching theCUBE. <laughs>